Uh, this is a short presentation afterwards now that was filmed by the uh, nice guys over here at the local community college. It's about 25-30 uh, minutes long. At the end of that, we'll show you how to order this tape as well as the class tape if you'd like to learn the physics behind what we're doing. Thank you very much. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now to continue with our workshop series, our workshop instructor, Mr. Mike Holler. Same pot scrubber that you see in the little glass jar here, where the big bubble would come out and then it's broken up by all the little weaving paths of the pot scrubber. Another way is through a diffuser plate, where we have the air coming down through the center, and then you see the holes that are drilled the whole way around the perimeter there. So the one big bubble comes out and then it's broken into a bunch of smaller bubbles by the diffuser plate. So now, let me just rehash everything. We're gonna bring air in through, and like in this bubbler, it comes down through this big pipe and then diffuses underneath the plate. Here we've got a steel tube that runs down, discharges the air where it bubbles up through the stainless steel wool. The plate should be just below the top of the surface level of the fuel so that you have the big bubble come up and it's gonna hit the plate and it's just kinda of work its way around and then work up through. So you can have it pretty much anywhere underneath the surface, but I seem to refer just a little bit, maybe a quarter of an inch under the surface level of the fuel. We're trying to phase change our liquid fuel into a vaporized fuel. That vapor then gets fed to the reactor, but if you feed liquid into the reactor, you don't get a very good reaction. In fact, you don't get any reaction. Which on gasoline, that may not be so bad because at least you're vaporizing the fuel in the reactor and you'll get better mileage than you would without it. But when you put other things in here, your engine doesn't run very well on vaporized, vaporized used engine oil. So we gotta get that stuff vaporized before feeding it into the reactor. So that's what we're trying to do with the bubbler is vaporize the fuel. After we vaporize the fuel, then we send it into the reaction chamber. Here's a reaction chamber where we make a bend here and a bend here, and then this pipe goes in through one end out the other straight. Now, we have a pipe inside of a pipe. The outer pipe, even with the inner pipe in there, is still going to flow the same amount of exhaust gases as it would had stock. Pi R squared, surface area of stock pipe, plus pi R squared, surface area of the outer diameter of your inner pipe. Add the two together, work it backwards. That'll give you what you need for your new outer pipe. And if it's between sizes, let's say whatever number you come up with is halfway between this size and this size, go with the smaller size, not the bigger. Let's go to the reaction rod. Reaction rod, made of steel. Inner pipe, made of steel. Outer pipe, made of steel. A lot of people say, well, will other materials work? Yes, they will. And some work better than steel. A lot of materials don't work at all, though. So to keep it simple, steel, steel, and steel. Now, the clearance between this rod and the inner pipe is going to be about the same no matter what you're building, whether it's a small setup like this something the size of the Suburban, or if you've got an irrigation pump that's gonna take a reactor like this, the clearance is still pretty much the same. So we want to tune the diameter of this rod and this pipe for the size of the engine. The length of the rod is tuned to the fuel that we're using. Now, if we were gonna run, say, propane through the reactor, propane has very small molecules. Those are three carbon molecules. It's a very light fuel. To break that down does not take much. For a propane system, we might have an inch and a half or two inch long reaction rod. Do a fantastic job. Gasoline, that's gotta be longer because it's much heavier than propane. So they're anywhere from four to seven and a half inches, depending on a few other things. Well, if we look at, say, diesel or used engine oil, now we're getting into some pretty long rods. 
because the bigger and the bulkier the molecule, the longer it takes to do the job on them and turn them into plasma. We need a longer reaction rod in there, longer chamber to house the rod. So let's say we're using gasoline. Let's say that, uh, well, this is uh, more of a gas diesel rod, okay, 50% diesel. We need to know how long we need to make the chamber, right? Well, here, you can see the pipe starting to come outside of the exhaust. That means that the effective reaction chamber is gonna stop about here. So we have reaction chamber in here, and just about here then, the rest of this pipe doesn't do anything, cannot be used for a reaction. So we have from here till about where the muffler starts. We look at the way the rod fits in there, then this reaction chamber is just about perfect for this rod that we're gonna use. We have between a half and one inch clearance on either side of the rod, inlet side and outlet side. Got between a half and a full inch worth of clearance between where the rod ends and where you run out of inner pipe. Once you get a reaction going, that rod's gonna center itself where it wants to be. As I slide this, the rod moves freely in there. That's what you want. You don't want the rod pressed in, you don't want it wedged in, you want it to be able to do its thing and move around as it sees fit. So you get the tabs turned so that it just slides in there nice and easy like. The rod does have to have steel in it. I know there's people thinking about all the materials they're gonna try because I said, yes, some work better than steel. So I'm gonna be the one to figure out what that other stuff is. As long as you have ferrous metal, iron, in the rod. Knock yourself out. I tried a brass rod and I didn't get squat for results because there's no iron in there. Now remember, we have an electromagnetic field in here. That all emanates from the rod. And if the rod cannot carry that electromagnetic field like the brass cannot, then we don't have our reaction. You mean between the tabs and the wall? I'd say five to eight thousand between each one. If you have pretty clean pipe, you could make it tighter than if you have pretty rough, like the black pipe we use has a ridge that goes up the center and you get occasional pieces of flashing on the inside. So you'd want it a little bit smaller. The purpose of the tabs is just to keep it kind of centered in that pipe. All right, it's not to locate it. And Paul tells me that once you got a good reaction going, and I've seen evidence of this to support it, but once you have a good reaction going, you wouldn't need the tabs. That the rod will just start out sitting on the bottom of the pipe. As you build up the reaction, it'll just kind of pick up and hover there, electromagnetically centering itself. No need for tabs. So it'll center itself this way and this way, all by itself, with or without the tabs. So you need some stops in there because usually when you have something like this elbow here, if the rod comes out past the pipe, it'll drop down and then the tabs will stick. And if it goes that far, then you've got part of the rod that's not doing any good for a reaction anyways when you do get the heat build up. So there's a couple things you can do. One is the twisted wire. And you just drop it in there to kind of put a spacer between your fitting and the rod. Another thing you can do, get a 12 penny nail and a drill bit just a hair smaller than the nail. Figure out where you want the end to be on your pipe. Drill a hole through there, drive the nail in, cut off all but about an eighth of an inch, flip it over, and then mushroom that part that you cut off with a hammer. Now the rod will go as far as that nail and stop. The difference in diameter of the rod between the generators and the Volkswagen is 1 32nd of an inch, and that makes a difference on those. The reaction chamber, when everything's tuned properly, is turning whatever we use as a fuel into a plasma. What is a plasma? Plasma is a state of matter. Now, in matter we have solids, we have liquids, we have vapors like the water that's in the air now we call humidity, and then a step above that would be plasma. Well, what's the difference between a vapor and a plasma? That was a question I had for a long time. Let's look at water as the example. In the solid form we have H2O ice. In the liquid form, we have H2O water. In the vapor form, we have H2O humidity. In the plasma form, we have H plus H plus O plasma. 
free floating atoms. Now it's oversimplifying it. I mean, there's ionic charges and things that I'm all confused about myself. But what we've done is we've taken a stable molecule and we've let the atoms free float. We no longer have molecules. We have free floating atoms. Essentially, that's what we're trying to do to our fuel in here. Now, what does it take to create plasma? Well, it takes a lot. There's, there's no lie about that. It takes a lot to turn matter into plasma. In fact, if we look at water, to turn water into plasma state requires about 3,800 degrees Fahrenheit at atmospheric pressure. But if we were to put that same water in a vacuum, 720 degrees Fahrenheit would give us our plasma. So under a vacuum, we can lower the energy requirements. But now wait a minute. First of all, we're not getting a perfect vacuum here. We're only getting, you know, 8, 10 inches of vacuum under normal operating conditions. That's, that's not enough. And, and we're not getting 3,800 degrees here or even near enough heat to turn our fuel into a plasma, even with the vacuum. But wait a minute. We have hot and cold going in opposite directions, don't we? That creates an electromagnetic field, right? Like a nice warm day like today, a low pressure cold front moves in, the hot and cold collide, and what do you get? You get energy buildup. Electrons excited. And after a while, that energy will discharge in the form of lightning. So, hey, okay, we got that. And to illustrate how an electromagnetic field can affect the bonds that we're trying to break, think of a permanent magnet. Uh, one inch diameter, six inches long permanent magnet, and then a chunk of steel of the same dimensions. We get the two of those close together, and they lock jaws. Kind of like an atom in a molecule. Now, if we take that piece of steel and we wrap some wire around that and hook it up to a battery, we might have to flip the battery once, but we can get a north-to-north -north polarity. And when that happens, the two chunks of metal will repel each other, right? The speed of sound has this ability of very much destabilizing structure. Now, here's a little law of nature. There's a Venturi in here. That's what you get when you have that reaction rod inside the pipe. It's a restriction. It's a Venturi. And the old carburetors, a lot of them would have a port in the Venturi, so you would have Venturi vacuum. Well, if you put a gauge on that port, measure that Venturi vacuum, and rev the engine high enough, and you would actually get 11 to 11 and a half inches of Venturi vacuum, the air going through that carburetor would be traveling at the speed of sound, Mach 1. 11 to 11 and a half inches of Venturi vacuum. So with this system, if we can get our air fuel charge up to 11 to 11 and a half inches of Venturi vacuum here, that doesn't mean the vacuum at the outlet side, the Venturi vacuum. Now we've got one more destabilizing factor. We've got the speed of sound. Plus thermal inertia, I've explained this before. It's like if you're getting on the freeway, you put the pedal to the metal because here comes a big old Schneider truck you want to beat. You get out on the freeway, you look down up, we're doing 75, and you back off. That speedometer will continue to climb for a little bit and then start to drop back down, right? Inertia. Let's go back to the reactor. We've got this relatively cool fuel vapor coming up in here. We'll say 110, 120 degrees. We've got this hot exhaust coming down through here, and at this point, it's about 1,000 degrees. Hot and cold going in opposite directions. Now, in nature, hot and cold actually physically collide. But here we have a pipe inside of a pipe. But the effect's the same. It's just like wearing gloves. You got surgical gloves on, you can feel what you're doing. You get the job done. The fuel is exposed to hotter and hotter and hotter walls as it travels up through. The exhaust is exposed to colder and colder and colder walls as it travels down through. You still get the same effect. Meanwhile, the fuel comes in here at a pretty slow clip. And it hits that rod, takes off. We're up to the speed of sound in no time, remember inertia? Plus the rod's pushing that fuel out against those hotter and hotter walls. Temperature takes off, thermal inertia. We actually have a point right about here in the middle where the fuel temperature exceeds that of the exhaust so much that it starts raising the temperature of the exhaust again. So we come out of here at 1,000 degrees. Here we are about 880 degrees drop down about 450 degrees uh, somewhere in here and then from 450 degrees it'll spike back up to about 700 degrees and then from there it'll linearly drop off again so the temperature of the exhaust comes out of here starts dropping off dropping off spikes up and then starts dropping off again because of the thermal inertia factor now 
We take uh, thermal inertia. We're getting a lot more heat energy, thermal energy, into the fuel than what we, per se, have in the exhaust here. Um, but not enough to disassociate matter into plasma. But we're doing it under a vacuum. That's still not quite enough to turn our fuel into a plasma. Hey, but we've got the electromagnetic field that's bouncing around here. You see, all of these elements combine together as a team. No one man can do it by himself. You ever hear that? You gotta work together as a team. We've got a team player here. Common stuff. Any science book, high school, college, it's all in there. It's just nobody ever tried putting them all together like this before. If you run the fuel and the exhaust in the same direction, you don't get a reaction. Take the reaction rod out, you don't get a reaction. So that's how the reaction chamber works. That was the second subassembly. Now we go to the third subassembly, the air management valve. The air management valve on this engine is two part. Our air valve here and our fuel valve here. And on an automobile or the generator, we can fit it all together into one compact unit where we have a fuel valve here and an air valve here. The air management valve can be on a stationary speed engine, like the generators, just one valve. On the generator, we took the stock carburetor that mounted here. We have the choke plate that we turn on to start it. Once we get it started, you slowly have to turn that choke off. As the heat builds up and we start getting warmer and warmer, you can slowly turn that choke off until you finally get a reaction going, then you can turn it off altogether. Meanwhile, the governor is working that little throttle plate over here as you change the load on it to maintain that constant speed. And this doesn't work on automobiles, I tried it. Take it one step further, the generators. If you run the stock generator, we use eight ounce cups for our testing. I mean, they have seven gallon tanks on them, it would take forever to do any kind of testing. So we just eight ounce cups at a time, we do our timing, watch the emissions. The stock generator would run about four minutes and 45 seconds on eight ounces of gasoline at half load, which is an industry test standard, half load. We put the gate fuel processor on there, and we've gotten it as high as over 10 minutes on eight ounces of gas, half load. But then we do a 50% gasoline, 50% diesel mix in there, eight ounces, four, e four ounces of each for a total of eight ounces, half load, and now we're up to over 14 minutes. So as you add higher energy fuel to the GEET, you get higher energy out. So if you put propane in, you get something a little bit smaller out, but the efficiency increase isn't there. Put crude oil in there, crude oil, used engine oil, something that's really got a lot of energy in it, and shove that up in there. Paul's blue engine, the one that's set up kind of like this with the aluminum bubbler here, big long board, that's set up to run on crude oil. And on eight ounces of crude oil, that son of a gun will run practically for a day, day and a half. Lots of energy in it. So to answer your question, I would much rather use gasoline than propane because there's a lot more energy in the gasoline. The cost per hour of operation is much less on the gasoline than the propane.